This is a typical Canadian pilot. Each and every day, Canadians like him break the surly bonds of Earth and take to the skies. Cautious and methodical, he is representative of the over 40,000 licensed pilots who make up Canada's general aviation community. Zulu and the runway has been swept since. Check that next rate of our once airborne, they travel great distances over inhospitable terrain through difficult weather. And sometimes, because of unforeseen mechanical problems, sudden changes in atmospheric conditions, or human error, their lives and the lives of their passengers take a sudden turn toward disaster. Here's the pilot of the world that goes out there expecting to not to come back. I mean, most of them will tell you it's it just happens, just so quick that, bang, uh, something goes wrong or they um, they do something wrong, and the next thing they're on the ground and wondering how the heck they got there. The final line of defense, the only piece of equipment on board that works automatically in a crash situation and independently of all other electronics, is the emergency locator transmitter or ELT. Emergency locator transmitters come in two types. The original ones operated a frequency of 121.5 megahertz, which was designated as the International Aircraft Distress Frequency in the 1950s. The beacons, when they were designed, weren't designed to work with the satellites. They did not have the frequency stability that required to pr provide precise location. The frequency wanders a little bit so that you can't come up with a perfect position with one satellite pass. And so it really messed up the position finding. The second model sends out a digital signal on an entirely new frequency, 406 megahertz. It was developed to resolve issues where the 121.5 fell short. The 406 are better in every possible aspect you can think of. They give you instantaneous detection. We know where you are, we know who you are, and we know how to find you. Whenever an ELT is activated, the signal is transmitted upwards, hundreds of miles to an Earth-orbiting satellite. Having satellites are like having eyes in the sky, literally in space. Having these eyes in space can pick up signals or emergency beacons several times a day. It is real life search and rescue drama that has played out successfully over 3,700 times and saved over 12,000 lives worldwide. 30% are aviation related. And we looked at all of the search and rescue incidents that uh, where there were survivors involved. And we found that the survival rates were greatest where we were able to get to the crash site the quickest. We found that after about 72 hours, the survival rate was extremely low, probably less than 10%. So that reinforced the notion that if you're going to find somebody, if you're going to pick a survivor out of an airplane crash, you've got to be there quickly. And uh, naturally, with the ELTs and the satellites, uh, that has that has resulted. We do get there much quicker than we ever did before when we had to search thousands of square miles of uh, territory visually to, to try and detect a, a broken airplane in the trees or a river it might be under snow or whatever. The constellation of satellites that picks up these distress alerts and notifies search and rescue authorities is called COSPAS SARSAT. On June 30th, 1982, Cosmos 1383 was launched from Plesetsk in northern Russia. It would be the first satellite to carry experimental COSPAS SARSAT technology as part of its payload. Within months, this test would chalk up its first success. September 9, 1982, a single-engine Cessna piloted by Joel Ziegelheim had been flying a search pattern over the Rocky Mountains in northern British Columbia. Ziegelheim and his two passengers were searching for an aircraft that had vanished more than seven weeks before. Suddenly their plane, unable to lift above the unexpectedly steep, rising valley floor of a canyon, crashed into the trees. What happened next would launch search and rescue into the space age. And they'd gone out and done an initial search without any luck when Ziegelheim was reported overdue. So I was called in to see if we could use the satellite system to help. At 2 a.m. Pacific time, Russia's Kospas-1 satellite picked up a 121.5 megahertz distress signal in the Rocky Mountains. The Russian satellite successfully relayed the signal to Canadian search and rescue authorities. We see the load to the Latin long they give us, and we're approximately about 10 miles away from the crash site, and uh, we picked up a DLT, 
and then uh, we circled around, and that's uh, I spotted the tent and the Casleys. And that's when we jumped in. The single-engine plane had crashed 80 kilometers, 50 miles, off its intended flight path and was way outside the prime search area. If it wasn't for the COSPAS satellite, it would have took us uh, maybe anywhere from three to four days, maybe a week to find the survivors. And uh, if we had to wait that long, the type of injuries they did have, there probably would have been some, uh, there probably would have been some deaths. You know, they, they wouldn't have made it. Finding Ziegelheim and his passengers dramatically proved the effectiveness of the brand new satellite technology for search and rescue. It was just a marvelous invention because it saved us so much trouble. Uh, we were able to home in on aircraft and home in on, uh, on people that needed rescue rather than having to search days and days and days, you know, a visual search and uh, sometimes those visual searches in some of the conditions, particularly in the winter with fresh snow, uh, you weren't going to find them. However, problems soon emerged. 121.5 megahertz was already the international aircraft distress frequency. Using that same frequency for the SAR satellite system would, in the long run, prove to have almost as many limitations as it had benefits. Now, there are many, many things in Canada that transmit on 121.5 megahertz. It could be from a faulty microwave to uh, a radio tower that's, uh, that does not function right. So there's lots of 1 to 1 1.5 hits that happens every day. False alerts can also be activated by ELTs themselves through pilot error. If it's a false alarm and, uh, and it's at an airport and the airplane's in the hangar, well, it's nice to know that nobody's been hurt. Uh, but it's also frustrating sometimes when you get called out in very bad weather. Uh, and um, you find out that an ELT had been taken out and, uh, for maintenance and was not secured properly, and now it has triggered the uh, search and rescue resources. In fact, 97% of the alerts received by rescue authorities on the 121.5 frequency are false alarms. Initially, when we get a 121.5 hit at a certain location, we just monitor it. We wait for a second satellite pass to confirm the location of the signal. Unless we have other evidence that an aircraft is overdue within the region where the detection is, then we will launch resources right away. They contact NAV Canada, the agency that keeps track of planes that are in the air. We get notified by the RCC that uh, they are picking up an emergency locator transmitting uh, signal and uh, they ask us to monitor it and or to if we have any aircraft uh, flying within the area to, to uh, check with the aircraft if they uh, can monitor 1215 if to see if they can pick up a signal. Flight plans or flight itineraries gives us the most of the necessary information required to start the communication search. So flight plans and emergency locator transmitters are both important tools to find a uh, uh, missing aircraft. Uh, would you uh, monitor frequency 121.5 to see if you hear any sig ELT signal? All this takes time. Valuable hours will pass before the 121.5 emergency signal can be declared real Depending and the incident becomes a SAR case. Go ahead with the instructions. Okay, the ELT signal is at 49.25 and 96.30. One volunteer group they turn to is CASARA, or Civil Air Search and Rescue Association. CASARA is called out whenever the DND needs the assistance, and we provide it in two formats, either providing spotters for the military air airplanes, or we use our own aircraft uh, to provide an initial response to local uh, incidences. We will call out our crew and ask them to come out to the airport uh, prepare their, their tasking sheets, get the maps plotted, uh, the search areas plotted, and then we'll uh, launch and uh, liaise with the Rescue Coordination Center uh, as the search progresses. Okay. You see where the drop hit? Casara pilots and spotters are made up of volunteers from the aviation community who do everything they can to go to the assistance of fellow pilots as well as people lost in the bush.
Realizing the flaws with 121.5 megahertz, Kospas Sarsat turned to digital technology to develop a new type of emergency beacon that provides much more than just a homing signal. The new more powerful beacon operates at 406 megahertz, an exclusive dedicated frequency that cannot be activated by any other type of equipment. Well, a few bits at the beginning of the distress message identify it as being from a 406 megahertz distress beacon and the ground receiving systems uh, check for those and if those bits are not in the message then the system uh, does not detect that as a distress beacon. There's also a significant improvement in accuracy. For 121.5 beacons, the older beacons, the accuracy is generally good to 12 to 20 kilometers. For searchers, if you, were, if you had an accuracy of 20 kilometers, you'd have to search uh, an area the size of a city, so it's a large search area. If you're searching for a 406 beacon, which has an accuracy of two to five kilometers, the search area corresponds to a, maybe a neighborhood in a city, so it's a much smaller area. And there's another improvement. With the 406 beacon, you're going to be detected immediately. As soon as that signal goes off, uh, the geosynchronous uh, satellites or the orbiting satellites are going to pick it up. And uh, they're going to be able to give a position uh, to the uh, search and rescue uh, centers within literally minutes of that ELT coming on the air. It takes all of the search out of search and rescue. The RCC can then direct an aircraft to a position on the ground. That's where you are. They're going to be over your head within hours. It's quick, uh, much sooner than if, uh, if you had a 121.5 beacon. And uh, if you're badly injured, it will make the difference between you living and dying. The 406 megahertz system has another technological edge, one that helps rescuers determine almost immediately who is in trouble. Encoded in that digital signal is a unique number, unique to that particular beacon. And if that beacon is registered, uh, one can correlate the owner of that beacon, a telephone number to call, uh, and so on and so forth, the type of boat it might be on, a type of aircraft it might be on, and get the get an understanding by a phone call of whether a real distress is occurring or not. By 2009, the old 121.5 megahertz frequency will be phased out of satellite processing. After that, the 121.5 beacons will no longer provide satellite alerting capabilities for their owners. For 121.5 users, search and rescue will be set back 20 years. What it means is basically we're going back to the era of uh, between 1972 and probably 76, 77 when somebody with a 121.5 beacon can be detected by another aircraft but won't be detected by satellite. And so once the satellites are not there, you're asking people to go and, and do a, basically a visual or electronic search for you. Uh, at, and, and quite often that encounters I involves bad weather at night. And uh, uh, whether it be Casera, whether it be the search and rescue guys who have to go out and, and try and detect that ELT or to try and find you visually, you're putting them at risk by not having the best equipment available to save your life compared to what you would be doing if you had a, a 406 beacon. In Canada, at least 47 people have lost their lives as a result of being involved in search and rescue missions. One tragedy in 1986 was especially difficult and heartbreaking. A light plane carrying two people went missing. A second plane with three people on board went searching for the first aircraft and also disappeared. Then a third search aircraft, a Canadian Forces Twin Otter with eight people on board also crashed. The search would be in its 20th day before all three aircraft would be discovered. There were no survivors. SAR authorities have much more confidence in the digital technology. 406 beacons have a, have a large advantage over 121.5 beacons in that we know where the beacon is and just as importantly who owns the beacon. And uh, what that does for us is uh, allows us to solve a lot of uh, false alarm cases prior to launching the aircraft. 406 megahertz digital technology has already proven itself reliable and effective. It has been successfully used in marine distress situations for more than 10 years. On April 5, 1999, Claude Bistoquet learned the true value of his 406 megahertz emergency beacon. While crossing the Atlantic, 650 nautical miles off Cape Cod, Massachusetts, 
His trimaran, the a cappella, caught in a storm with heavy seas and 60 to 70 knot winds, suddenly capsized. He and crewman Francois Forestier found themselves in desperate trouble. The United States Coast Guard, with Canadian SARS support, responded. There was no way for them to signal for help, even though they had all of the latest electronic equipment on board. But what they did have on board was a 406 megahertz EPIRV. Using this system, we were able to nail down the time and the place. We knew where they were. We knew when they lit off that beacon, when it was picked up by the satellite. We knew the name and full description of the vessel. And by the time we were able to talk with their family, how many people were on board, their experience level, the fact that it was a watertight compartment, and all this other information. When we arrived on scene, we deployed both rescue swimmers into this 25-foot seas. Um, they swam to the capsized vessel. The two personnel popped the hatch, uh, the two French citizens. They climbed out, uh, very cooperative. They were both harnessed up, one after the other, lifted up to the helo. They had uh, mild to moderate hypothermia and otherwise were in very good condition. And so as we say in the Cospest Sarsat and search and rescue business, two lives saved. Because timing is so crucial in search and rescue operations, the 406 megahertz system provides a huge technological upgrade. Take the case of Benoit Boulet. In May of 2000, the helicopter pilot found himself alone and seriously injured on the polar ice near Resolute Bay in Nunavut. His two passengers died on impact. I was flying with scientists um, looking for polar bears, uh, studying the polar bears and their uh, feeding habits. By the time that uh, the work was done, the cloud cover was coming in. When I took off, I had reference to Lothar Island, which was about seven miles to the south of my position. Uh, it's when I made the turn to go to Resolute Bay that I get into uh, a whiteout condition. Then I tried to turn back to Lothar Island, but uh, during that turn, I hit the ice. From the instant that the aircraft touch the ground, it's a complete blackout, and then I'm I wake up. I'm waking up on the ice. So I had my left leg badly broken. I had my right ankle broken. Uh, my right arm was broken. I had some bones broken. My left hand. I tried to talk to my two uh, passengers, but there was no answer. So then I saw. Uh, sleeping bags close by, so I crawled 50 feet to ret retrieve those sleeping bags and try to keep me warm a little bit. From, from the chopper itself, there was nothing left that could be salvaged, uh, I mean the radio system of the helicopter, but we usually carry an uh, emergency HF radio, so I was able to retrieve that radio. Uh, the only problem is that I had a 50-foot antenna to deploy, which I was not able to do. Seven hours after the crash, authorities back in Resolute became concerned and initiated a search. All they knew was the general area he was in. Full tanks and the nature of the work meant that the search area would be huge. During the first six hours after the crash, nine COSPAS SARSAT satellites had passed over but failed to pick up the signal. Then COSPAS 4 heard a brief burst from Boulay's 121.5 megahertz distress signal but the signal quickly disappeared. Because it was a 121.5, the RCC, or Rescue Coordination Center, could not verify that this was an actual distress until Resolute notified them one hour later about the overdue helicopter. The RCC had only enough data to narrow the search area down to 160 square kilometers. And uh, 097, 00.9 west. Uh, what we found was the helicopter had the, the ELT mounted uh, on a window or door frame close to the pilot in, in the front of the, of the helicopter. When the helicopter struck the ice, uh, these components were basically pulled apart and, and severely damaged. So uh, the, uh, the unit itself was disconnected from its antenna and uh, it was basically turned upside down and it was, it was buried in the snow. It was not doing very well, but it was, it was doing enough that uh, we could tell it was, it was functioning, but it just wasn't, it wasn't able to get its message out. Searchers were not able to home in on the signal because it was neither strong enough nor long enough, even though it returned briefly a few more times. 
Ten more hours would pass before the pilot was found. Things would have been different with a 406 beacon. Well, the 406 beacon transmits a signal about 100 times more powerful than a 121.5 beacon. So even if it were damaged, it still would have likely been picked up several hours earlier, and this would have allowed the rescue efforts to be uh, initiated much earlier. You think about your loved one, your, uh, my girlfriend, my son, uh, my parents. Uh, you think you don't want to die there. Thirteen hours after the helicopter went down, a twin otter spotted Brule semi-conscious, huddled among the wreckage. There's one plane that flew probably less than two miles from me, but couldn't see me. And the one that found me flew right over me, right over the crash team, and uh, I've seen it. So, And then it, when it turned around, okay, I knew they found me. The plane landed near the debris. Boule was airlifted first to Resolute, then to Ottawa. The pilot was out there basically longer than he would ever otherwise have been because of the problems uh, developing this, uh, this signal. Well, he must have been wondering if his distress signal ever did get received and whether they knew uh, that it was him in distress. If it had been a 406 megahertz beacon, the identification code that would be in the distress signal would have uh, advised the SAR forces who they're going to look for. And this would allow rescue efforts then to be undertaken several hours earlier. 801 Papa November. When a 406 ELT beacon alert came into the U.S. Air Force Rescue Coordination Center at Langley recently, it demonstrated in no uncertain terms how this advanced digital technology makes a big difference in a SAR case. It is an ELT. It is a CSTA ELT per the registration data. Well, in, in the case of uh, what you saw today, what we had was an unlocated uh, registered 406 aviation beacon. When we resolved the situation, it really wasn't on long enough for that initial data burst of uh, geo coordinates to get in there. But the registration data was current, it was up to date, with two phone calls. First phone call to the work location, uh, left a message, second phone call to the home location. But on the second phone call, got a hold of uh, the person on the registration data, asked him about his aircraft. He said, it's in the hangar, I'll check on it. Within five minutes, he had called me back and said the aircraft is safe, it's uh, in the hangar. We were doing some work on the ELT and accidentally uh, activated it. So from start to finish, I don't think it was 10 minutes before we had complete resolution of the case because uh, it was 406. It was properly registered, and we could resolve okay, you, the situation now. In a 121.5, that would be impossible. Sitting at the hangar in Bedford, Mass. He's going to go check on it right now. Resolved. The entire incident was wrapped up with a few phone calls rather than with a pointless search that would have taken hours to verify and track down, wasting valuable SAR resources. The 406 megahertz digital beacons are more expensive than their older analog cousins, Transport Canada and the avionics industry are working hard to change this. What we're trying to do in the development of this 406 uh, low-cost ELT project is reduce the cost of the 406 ELT. Uh, we feel it's very important to have a ELT that is affordable to pilots, to general aviation, and we're doing the R&D work so that we can get this unit as low-cost as possible. Pilots have been reluctant to trade in their 121 megahertz beacons and buy a 406 megahertz beacon because of the, uh, the increased cost. So if we can bring it down to the price that they are used to paying for a 121 megahertz beacon, then uh, we're hoping to open up that market and to be able to maintain the, the safety of flight for those pilots. We're trying to bring some of the latest technologies that have been put into cell phones and pagers into the ELT in order to take advantage of the economies of scale that those industries have been able to, uh, to develop. 121.5 beacons have served their owners well for more than a quarter century, but they are slowly going the way of rotary dial phones, charcoal barbecues, and Morse code. Well, most of the 121.5 beacons in use today were designed in the uh, late 1960s, so they've been around for uh, some 30 years. I don't know why someone would risk their life using 30-year-old technology when 406 megahertz beacons are available today. They're much more effective, they uh, do a lot more, and the performance is technically far superior. 
like anything else, technology is finding its way into our business, and, the, and some of these technological advancements will just revolutionize the way we do business. 406 megahertz ELTs offer technological advantages now. They are an essential piece of life-saving equipment that should be on board every plane. With annual maintenance and fully charged batteries, your beacon will aid pilots, passengers, worried family members, and those who risk their own lives to come to your assistance. 406 ELTs, taking the search out of search and rescue.